Hi everyone, today we're covering e 3 n together with uh, Dr. Geiger and yeah, if you want to join the future reading group sessions yourself, all the stuff is in the description. Cool. Then I guess we're already two minutes in it so we can get started. Hi everyone, great, great to have you here and, and uh, yeah, today we, we're having a little bit of a difference, a format where we don't have a presenter that's presenting some slides, but instead we're just scrolling through the paper and yeah, uh, asking the author <laughs> some, some questions about it. But also if you have any questions at any point, then feel free to, to ask them. Um, yeah, then should we maybe, should I say some a few words about you or do you want to say? Oh, um... I can present myself, of course. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Mario Geiger. I come from Switzerland. Um, I studied physics. And uh, at the end of the studies of physics, I started to do some machine learning. And I found a way to join the two machine learning and physics by mixing like symmetries coming from physics and neural networks coming from machine learning. And I, I was uh, passionate about uh, this equivalent neural network because they are like uh, like the Lagrangian in physics that has that is that has the symmetries of of your physics and it's the same but for machine learning and uh, and then I also did a, a PhD where I uh, with a professor who was physicist and we studied um, we, we tried to understand uh, why machine learning works and uh, how it works with like a bit of a empirical physicist approach. That sounds nice. I, I like the physicists coming into machine learning, revolutionizing the field, like Max Welling or my advisor Tommy, <laughs> and now also you. Um, microphone off. No, start broadcast. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen now to get our E3NN paper here. And then I'll have my notes over here. Just what I want to talk about. Uh, yeah, so first I wanted to, yeah, to, to get into Maybe can you say what is e three and n useful for? Why do I need it now? Why do I want it? Um, I mean, I would say basically for every application that involves three d data that are not projections, if because if you take a picture, it's a projection of three d data, and then you e three and is is useless for that. But if you have the whole three d object, uh, then it's it really can be useful if you don't want to do machine learning on, on this kind of pattern. Okay, so we have some 3D object and we um, want to do machine learning on the data, so it and n is, is useful, you say. And then, yeah, let's maybe to, to get into this, um, into it and n, let's first go through the groups. And I would do that as introduction by example and just look at some permutation like the permutation group and yeah there right we could have for example a permutation of um of two elements and then in our group we have the like we have the identity that does nothing if, if this this is our like uh, the objects that we're permuting, then the identity uh, does nothing to them. And then we also have the flip of these. So flipping these around. And then we have like two and one. Yeah. And if we have three objects, then our um, permutations of these three objects would be six different permutations, right? And we would have this and we would have Oh God, uh, one, three, two. Um, yeah, and let me not try to do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these are maybe groups in 
a too quick manner, but maybe we uh, most of us know know about groups uh, a little bit. Uh, but then we can also have these representations of groups, right? And here you. Uh, by the way, thank you for for this paper, right? Because you have your tensor field networks paper, you have your tutorials online in your videos. Uh, but this really is um, what made brought the most clarity to me. Yeah, but now we have representations, right? And if we have a group, um, yeah, if we have a group, then we can map each element of the group to a to a matrix of a of a certain dimension, mm -hmm. right? And now, for example, if we have our um permutation so this is actually called s2 then is it right yeah of permutations, two elements, yes. permutations of two elements and then we can have like this the the do nothing permutation and the flip it around permutation and right we could represent this as a uh, these as matrices where we do nothing uh, or where we flip it around and the reason why these are mm -hmm. now yeah like we could have this as a representation mm -hmm. um and maybe this is a nice representation yeah you want to say something i want to say that you you can show many examples of representation for this same group from for instance you can have also uh the identity and then uh, the matrix with minus one on the diagonal which is also a representation of this group. Ah, yes. Okay, so another representation would be um, this and this. For instance, also you can also put the minus one on, on both of them. As long as it, it respects the property that is below here, we can check. The property that is below... Yeah, these two properties, yes. Here. Yeah, so as long as the first matrix is uh, is the identity, the first property is fine. And for the second property, you just have to check that if you do the second matrix time itself, it gives you the identity. So, uh, so the, the, the if second, you, well, the, yeah. the second property just tells us that if we uh, do combine these two group elements and end up with another element in the group and then we go to our representation then this is the same as if we were to first go to our representation and then do the matrix multiplication then. right yes. yeah uh, and now you're saying this with the identity right uh, because this is just a flip and if we then multiply it with itself we should end up with the identity yeah okay um but now right we have these representations and now you talk about these irreducible representations and if we continue going with our example mm -hmm. um now maybe just first uh, what is an irreducible representation uh, it's a representation that we can't write um as a as matrices of something smaller yes so um so think of the representation as um some data that uh transform under your group that can transform under your group and uh, uh sometimes you can split this bunch of data into two uh two two distinct uh object that both rotates under the direction of the group independently and if you can do that it's it means that this representation is not irreducible and when you cannot cut in two anymore then it's become irreducible for instance if you take a vector these three numbers you cannot pull one number away and apply a rotation on on just the x uh, component of the vector and yeah and the two others yeah. but we don't always have the splitting up uh, thing happening if we go from a, a representation to a irre irreducible representation right um we also have whoop, whoop, whoop. 
we also yeah let's remove the, these examples quickly maybe right here we have our permutations and here we have like a, a, a representation of the permutation group right but this is not irreducible because we could also represent it by one and minus one these matrices of dimension a dimension one right yes and so, this would yeah. be a irre an irreducible representation of the permutation group and it would i thought there was a comment no well and it would even also be a a faithful irreducible representation right because um we could always we could always have a or like the representation uh, uh, so a, an irreducible representation does or a representation does not necessarily have to be a bijection between the group and the, the matrices right we could also mm -hmm. have many 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 group elements and then only um, a few matrices mm -hmm. and then map them like this uh yeah yeah uh, but if we have a faithful representation of the group which i guess we kind of always want with our equivariant stuff right i mean depends for instance scalars are very very useful and they are clearly not a faithful representation uh, since every element of the group is mapped to the identity matrix okay okay well then let's just ignore my comment here <laughs> uh, but <laughs> If we have a faithful representation, then we have one. Um, yeah, exactly. We have one matrix for each yes. each group element. Yeah, yeah, cool. But now, like, we have one irreducible representation up here of S S two. Yeah, but sometimes we also have like these um, representations. Uh, but, uh, yeah, sometimes we also have a representation and it's not irreducible and then we can like split it up into a direct sum of um irreducible representations and that's what you yes. meant right with the splitting up yes yes okay but now i also in, in the audience always feel free to raise your hand or interrupt us or rambling yeah I, we also have the questions in the chat um what's the general form of a matrix that follows that second group requirement uh, I, i'm not sure what uh the general form of a matrix that follows um the second group requirement uh, uh yeah i'm i'm not sure what you mean right now maybe you can clarify a little bit but now let's go to irreducible can you can you give some example on how you can find the irreducible representation um is it is there like an algorithm to find irreducible representations i don't think so uh i i don't know honestly uh, that's a tricky question i i'm uh, honestly not an expert in uh, group representation uh, i mean i'm used to the group of rotation and uh, i read some uh, there is some yeah there's uh, many books that explain how to find the irreducible representation of, of rotation and also a uh, Lorentz group, uh, and it goes with the upper and lower ladder operator. Uh, it's kind of fun. I never really went into the details. Uh, uh, so, but in general, I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe we can give an other example. Like I, I thought now of giving the example of D3 or S, S3. Which is the same, right? D three, which um, is D three, uh, the dihedral. Ah, yes, mm -hmm. a dihedral group mm -hmm. with three elem or uh, with like a three polygon. Or I don't know how to call it. Ah, um, polygon with three face, three like uh, a triangle. Yeah, a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> a triangle. <laughs> uh, and um, or like just S three. And then showing the irreducible representations of that. Should we? Should yeah, we sure. Sure. Okay. Should we should. All right, then let's let's draw it here. 
So we have S3. And so these are now the permutations of all um, uh, of, of three elements. Like if we have three, three balls and we want to permute them, then one representation of that would be matrices, right? Matrices like this. This is the identity, which wouldn't uh, change our elements if we, if we multiply them with vector multiplication here, or which wouldn't permute, permute them if we multiply them with vector multiplication here. So this is the first ele element. Then we have another element which switches around the last two. And then we can switch around the first two. Then we need three more. We can switch around the first with the third. We can switch the, oops. We can switch whatever we're switching here and we can switch whatever we are switching here. Um, um, um. So this would be one representation of the of S three, the permutations of three elements, right? But this is not irreducible. An irreducible representation could actually be made of um, one representation, right? This is a representation of three by three matrices. But there is a representation where we have two by two matrices with a direct sum with one by one matrices, so just numbers. And this would be, for example, um, we have one and minus one. These are the, the, one, uh, the, the one by one matrices. And we have um, like rotation matrices where we have rotations by three, uh, by like uh, two pi a third, over three. A third mm -hmm. around the circle. Yes, two pi over three. So we have um, cos two pi over three. So we're rotating. Yeah, uh, we're rotating by two pi over three around the circle. This is our circle. In the beginning, we're here. Then if we multiply with this uh, matrix, uh, well, if I say this matrix, maybe we, I should write it down. Two pi over three um, sine two pi over three and cos two pi over three. And yeah, if we multiply a vector in two, 2D with this matrix, right, then we rotate it by a, a third around the circle. Then we can multiply again, and then we rotated it by two thirds around the circle. And then we can multiply it again, and we end up back where we back where we left off. So right, we have uh, we have two more of these matrices. We have two more. No, we have only one more. Uh, yes, and, and uh, I didn't yes. see. So we have two more of these matrices, uh, which is um, like this matrix squared, mm -hmm. um, squared, <laughs> and also the identity. Right. So now this is a direct sum or it's is it called direct sum or direct product? Uh, direct uh, sum. Di yes. Direct sum of these two groups, which is the same as the these two representation. representation. Yeah, I would say. Oh, okay. They, they, these two oh, representations. Yeah, but maybe they map to subgroups. Maybe. Yeah, they actually map to subgroups. This representation. This, the first representation is the, also a representation of S two, 
Yes. And the second representation is also a representation of uh, rotation by uh, a third of uh, the circle. But uh, uh, but it always has to be the case, no? No, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. So I for uh, rotation in 3D, for instance, uh, L equal 2 or L equal 3 represent, uh, irreducible representation, uh, I, I don't think they, are, they correspond to a particular other group than uh, SO3, they are just a representation of SO3. So this is, um, this is a, I would say, a special case that these two representations maps to other groups. OK. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, does yeah, really the, matter in this case? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, now we also. Yeah, right. We all know what equivariance is. We won't go over that. Uh, or yeah, I, I there's many questions. Uh, yeah, there there are many questions. <laughs> and so, now but it also answer to question which is very useful for us. Yes, but let's go to Samar. I don't understand how minus one is also a representation of the group element in permutations S2. So minus one is a representation of yeah so if we have s2 uh, right then we could have our we could have our matrices here as a representation um where we then have like a vector with two elements and if we multiply it with this matrix then we get out the same vector And now, if we multiply it with the, the matrix down here, then we get out the two things switched around. So, um, yeah, and that's why this is like a, a, a nice representation, I guess, that we often use, like, as initial representation now yeah, I don't know how to, to say it but uh, now why is this a representation according to our definition right that's the case because if we multiply zero one one zero so this representation of the of the second group element that per actually permutes stuff if we multiply it with <clears throat> the only other group element that is there that's not the identity so itself, so if we square it, then that is the same as zero zero one as the, the identity. And that is also what happens in the group, right? If you first flip and then you flip again, and then you go to a group representation, then you would have ended up here. And this is the same as this. And that's what we're saying here, right? So this is the representation. Now for one and minus one, this is also the case, right? If we have our uh, our one two, which maps to one, and we have our two one, so our actually flipping stuff, which maps to minus one, right? Then if we multiply minus one with minus one, then we also end up at one. So if we first uh, did our two one and then our two one again, which will give us one two, <laughs> and then we go to our group representation, or we first go to our uh, we we first go to our group representation here and to our group representation here, and then we do the matrix multiplication here, which is just the multiplication in this case. We also end up with a one, so this is the same. This is a group representation. Mm. I don't know how clear this was now, but yeah, maybe this was helpful for some. Um, but yeah, we also have to maybe ca cover some space here. Um, if I remember, mm -hmm, yeah, we, we can't get into it for everything, but maybe we can okay. also go into stuff at the mm -hmm. end. But do you find something that's especially uh, good to get into now? Uh, something? Yeah, because you want to say something? Oh, no, I was okay. just saying that most of these messages are just answers to other yeah, questions. That's great. Thank you, Simon, uh, or Simon, 
Simon Mattes and David Ruddle and Rhys Cheng. Cheng. Okay, um, but now why why do I care about the reducible representations? Um, because the because they are small representation and they are like the the building blocks. If you think about Lego pieces, they are the, the smallest pieces, and then you can put them together with the the um, so the direct sum. They are building blocks of uh, groups of of representations. Yeah. Okay. Of group representations, and now. Uh, but yeah, in the end, we actually care about them, right? Because we said we want to do machine learning on 3D stuff. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we actually care about them because, um, I mean, we we now have these irreducible representations of SO3. Um, so we care about them because any uh, 3D data that transform in the rotation uh, transform with some representation and this representation can always be split into the irreducible representation so if you if you have uh, something that man that handles all the irreducible representation then you can handle all the representation once you you split it in pieces okay but then let's actually get to this uh, irreducible representations of rotations where do we have them here um yeah so here now we're still just um covering some stuff to then and then in the end we put the stuff together and find out why it is useful and find out how it is useful in e3 and n so uh, irreducible ro representations of rotations, apparently. So uh, Mario is just telling us here in this text uh, that the irreducible representations of SO3, so the um, group of rotations in 3D, they are indexed by integers, so well, mm, which we call L, and the irreps, of this group element. So if we have a, or you know, the dimension of these irreps, right? Our irreps are just d by d matrices. Well, in, in our language here now, and the, the dimension is always 2L plus one. So if we have zero, then the dimension, uh, the um, or the L equals zero, representation or the l equals zero irrep is a one by one matrix the l equals one is a three by three matrix l equals two irreps are five by five matrices okay and yeah so instead of for example Right. We also have a representation of SO3, which are three by three matrices. Is that correct? Oh uh, yes. The, the, yeah. the L equal one. Well, but is is the isn't the three by three matrix a faithful representation of SO3? Oh yes, yes. This the vectors are a faithful activity that. Uh, uh, they, they are all faithful except the scalars, I guess. They are all bijection of, of, um, of with respect to the group. Wait, wait, wait. But then uh, if they are all faithful, how can the five dimensional thing be a, um, be an irrep? Uh, it is an irrep because there is no sub vector space. Um, Okay, so, so uh, with the, with the five dimensional thing, we we just wander. No, I don't. I don't get it. Um, so you're saying that I. So my thinking in previously was I have this representation of three by three matrices, right? Just our usual representation uh, rotation matrices that mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. when we mess around with. Yeah vectors in yeah. 3d space yeah that's the elegant mm -hmm. one that's this one 
so so these are exactly the same yeah that's these are exactly the same these are by definition these are the elements oh, okay but then why do i need the reference to start <laughs> because some data transform with richer representation than than l equal one uh if you imagine uh uh a signal on, on a sphere uh like uh, um i don't know the, the temperature on the surface of the earth it's a signal on the sphere you can rotate it it's a very complex data but this is a representation of uh, rotation that you can uh, decompose into irreducible representation you can actually represent this function on the basis of the spherical harmonics and all the coefficients will transform with each of these else so this here you will see that all the else are useful mm -hmm. okay okay but now my mm, right and my, what i understood is that we're so what i thought in the beginning is i have these oops that was an eraser i i have these three by three matrices here uh, maybe I should put something so we actually see that it's three by three. And um, though this is a representation, and now I decompose this into a direct sum of one by one, three by three, five uh, by five, uh, dot, dot, dot. And um, don't mess up between the representation of vectors, which is a three by three matrix, and the representation of a three by three uh, matrix, which is a nine by nine matrix. So in the example below, I consider how a three by three matrix transform. So, and uh, this is a nine dimensional object, so it transforms with a nine by nine matrix yeah yeah okay well if we talk i also saw this confusion happening mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. um right uh, what is a representation um let me see where that was yeah, what is a representation a representation is a function from our group element to a d by d matrix. Yes, and this okay. d by d, and d matrix, they act on the vector space of dimension d. And the object you transform will be of dimension d, and they will be transformed by those matrices. Ah, okay, so if I have an object of dimension five, then the then I, I need this mm -hmm. exactly which will be matrices five by five okay so um but if i have a vector of dimension five then i thought i'm not here talking about s of three i would be talking about s of five and not necessarily you can have a you can have data that are dimension five and transform under the group of rotation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. exactly the example below. Um, if you consider a, a, a three by three matrix that is transformed by taking in but by, by being multiplied left and right by the, the rotation matrix. Oh, wait a second. So we have a symmetric three by three matrix. And do those you now put into um into a vector like this so the symmetric matrix you put into a vector with nine elements is that right you yeah you can do that okay exactly. so so that's not right um what, what is or x? Both, both are possible x is exactly these uh these nine uh, numbers okay so still in the three by three uh, so it's still in the three by three matrix format mm -hmm. yes and and you you to to transform under rotation you multiply on the left and on the right by the 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 this three by three matrix of rotation okay so um we have a yeah good good, the, good. 
Yeah, you have many examples in physics of objects like that, like the stress tensor. Yeah, but we don't care about this. Just we, to motivate we now, <laughs> we now care about uh, this, the very simple task that we want to get to in the end, where we have 3D coordinates and maybe vectors between 3D coordinates, right? And we want to bring that 3D information into our uh, network in an equivariant mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. Um, well, I'm I'm aware that e three nan can do much more, but uh, I guess that's uh, that is the the main thing that also most of the audience cares about, and me, right? Because I want to mess around with molecules. So now, where should we go? Yeah, we have these irreducible representations of rotations, and they are um, like one or one by one matrices, three by three matrices, five by five matrices. If we have uh, vectors that we want to transform under SO3, uh, but they are like five by five, uh, five dimensional vectors. Then we need to then we need to use this, yeah. And sometimes if we if we use this, right? If we use this, then oh, why would we want to use this in our network? Because then we can get uh, like richer interactions. Or... Yeah, richer. <laughs> so uh, the best answer is that you have better performance if you cool. use more. Uh, I like better performance. <laughs> Then irreducible representations used in E3 and N. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So we again look at the irreducible representations of SO3 of order L. Um, yeah, let's let's not get into that. Let's <laughs> circle harmonics. So now we 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 use this spherical harmonics, which, which is the last ingredient before we say what e three and n mm -hmm. actually does. And mm, I would I would say so. Let's quickly uh, get this last um, ingredient covered as well. So what the spherical harmonics are are functions that go from a point on the sphere. Um, from the unit sphere to the irrep dl, so to uh, d dimension. So yeah, this is not true in my opinion. Um, here you write the spherical harmonics are a family of functions from the unit sphere to the irrep dl. Right. This would mean that we have a function from a, let's say. A I, I I see where you are going because uh, I used the. I mean, when I say into irrep dl, I mean into the yeah. a vector space on which dl acts. Yes. So it is a function from um, oops, a function from the unit sphere to um, to uh, yeah. How do I write it? To the yeah, to to a vector on which uh, that transforms according to uh, that tr transforms according to SO three, if we multiply it with the irreps of DL. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but usually in in math textbook. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah. this. Uh, they, they do this. They do this. Uh, I don't know that they do this. <laughs> and I, I read your paper. Yeah, yeah. And after this, I thought that the output of our YL are matrices. No, no. And no. this was a problem. <laughs> yeah, sorry for the confusion. I think I, 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 at some point, I, I say it. Uh, I introduce the representation. Uh, uh, somewhere I say that. Uh, I should have said at least no, that uh, I mean, we use this, the same word for both the vector space on which it acts and uh, the, the matrices themselves. Fair. Uh, then yeah. everything's right in the paper. I hope I, I was still confused. I, didn't forget to, I hope I didn't forget. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I would change it. The... <laughs> yeah, sure. For simplicity. Yeah. Um, cool. But no, no, no. We let's get into why this is interesting. We have functions from the unit sphere to vectors that transform um, according to SO3 if we multiply them with the irreps. So we, for example, have now an irrep. Um, an irrep of L equals zero here. We have an irrep of L equals one here. Uh, we have an irrep of L equals five here. Right, and these are real irreps and not, not the vectors that irreps act on. Uh, and now what the spherical harmonics do is that, for example, they take a vector which is a point on the sphere. Do we have some sphere here? Um, which is a point on the sphere. And our origin is maybe here. And this is this vector here. And what our spherical harmonics do is we can throw them in here. So the y zero of this vector Or oh, let's call this x. And then we have the y0, um, the y0 of this x. This will be some number. And this number we can multiply with the irrep of, uh, with irreps of d equal uh, d, d0, or irreps of l equals 0. And it will then transform according to SO3. And we can also not only look at the scalar representations that the spherical harmonics assign to this vector, we can also look at the vector representations that the spherical harmonics assign to that vector. And this will then be some three by three vector, which we can multiply with these irreps. Right, and then we can go on and on and look also look at L equals two. Oops, L equals two. And this will be a five vector, which we can multiply with these. Do you want to say something? No, I'm just reading the questions. Yeah. Okay, so really the our spherical harmonics, uh, let me draw them like this, uh, by zero, y1, y1, y1. Um, by the way, have you seen this sort of drawing somewhere? I don't know where I picked it up. Um, zero, y. One, two, three, four. Yeah, right. So our L and I always have the y equals L, and then here we have the index, uh, the index in our vector. Mm -hmm. And so, we, yeah, the spherical harmonics are functions that yeah, produce a single number of a vector, they, or if you have L equals uh, L equals one, then they produce three numbers for a vector. If we have L equals two, then they produce five numbers for a vector. And these numbers, you can then always multiply them with irreps of S of three, and they will transform um, according to a group, or how would you say it? Yeah. Okay. And now, how do we... Um, now, a cool thing about these spherical harmonics is also this here, right? Uh, can you tell me why this is cool or the, about the equivariance? Um, so, um, so you can define the spherical harmonics just by imposing that the equivariant function that does that. Yeah, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, now this spherical harmonics, we did not get to spherical harmonics yet. Let's say that we now just say we want these functions that do what we just described, but then they also do uh, this thing right here where they 
um, where if you multiply the inputs with a, or if you ro rotate the inputs, then you will get the same thing as if you were to rotate the output with these um, with these irreducible representations of the rotation group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So here we rotate the outputs, and here we rotate the inputs. Okay, and that, and that's equivariance. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we have that. We can now we can now take our vectors on the sphere and rotate either their input um, or we can rotate the output and it will be uh, equivalent. Yes. So you want to say something? Oh, maybe why we want uh, always to have equivalence everywhere. So uh, I think we are in the learning of graphs and geometry reading group. So the importance of equivariance. No, you, you go ahead. Oh, because uh, the quantity you want to predict, let's say you have a molecule and you want to predict the energy, uh, is, a, is an equivariance function. For instance, the energy is a scalar, so it does not transform in the rotation. If you transform, if you rotate your molecule, you, you still have the same energy. Um, if the molecule is isolated, uh, so you would like the energy to be an, equ uh, an equivariant function. And so if you also, what is cool about equivariance is that if you compose two functions that are equivariant, uh, the composition is also equivariant. So if your network is made of composition of equivariant function that at the end lead to an, a scalar, that's an equivariant uh, function that can be used to train on the energy typically. So, so basically, we want to build all possible equivalent functions to be able to compose them together to make a neural network. Okay, we want to build all possible equivariant functions, even if we want to predict something invariant. I mean, invariant is equivalent. It's a special yeah, case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, we can do the, the non-invariant equivariant stuff in some layers. And then in the end, to something predict something invariant by pooling features, for example, right? And oh, there's many ways to get to an invariant function. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's not uh, get into that. We are all convinced that uh, being equivariant um, is something that of that's often important, and also that if we uh, predict something um, invariant in the end then having layers um, before predicting something invariant that are non-invariant, but, uh, but still equivariant is important, uh, can be helpful. Okay, um, but now I guess I'm kind of, I kind of lied when I said that the spherical harmonics are the last ingredient. Uh, because we still need this uh, this tensor product ingredient, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and this tensor product is not a tensor product, I would say. <laughs> so, like, it's a, uh, or at least not what I know as a tensor product. So, to everyone who is now who do, now doesn't know um, what exactly the tensor product in E three and N is. Um, don't confuse it with what you might already know as a tensor product. All right, but uh, what we uh, what we do here is we want to combine. Uh, we have two vectors, and we want to we want to combine them in some way. Yeah, uh, I think someone is unmuted and wants to comment. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, Let... sorry, it's mistake. Sorry, just carry on. All righty, thanks. Um, and then so basically, we want to multiply them together. Oh, okay. Uh, but I could also multiply them element wise. Oh yes, but it would not be equivalent. Ah, cool. So we want to multiply two vectors 
uh, in an equivariant fashion. Exactly. So, and that's what this tensor tensor products does. Um, yeah. And here, first of all, what Mario says, I guess, is that we um, right we have these vectors, for example, of l equals zero, or of l equals one, or of l equals two. And if we multiply um, a vector of l equals two to uh, with an so this right here with a vector of l equals three, uh, sorry, of l equals one, then we will get out multiple vectors. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, and these vectors will be um, l equals one, whoops, l equals one minus two and the absolute value of that. So that is one, mm -hmm. um, that is one. And then we have less than, less than, and then we also have plus and one plus two equals three. So we now have that our, the output, the vectors uh, that we get out, um, they are of L equals one, they are of L equals two, and they are of L equals three. So if we do our tensor product or weird, yeah, let me call it weird tensor product. If we do a weird tensor product between something of L equals two and L equals one, then we get out three vectors of L equals one, two, and three. Yeah, and or we can get all of these out, and this will then be a, a equivariant. Yes. Um, and I don't know how. What do you think is the best way to go about this? Should we go into this example right here? Um. Um. No, not necessarily. Okay. No, <laughs> let's not. Um. But I think you don't just think we should go into this. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a nice visualization of the tensor product. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a vector, so something like this. So just to state, uh, so there's like three properties that we really want when we want to multiply, uh, when we don't want to do a tensor product. Uh, we want no, it's fine, it's fine. We basically want it to be, uh, I mean, what we want is is what is a multiplication and what is equivalent. So multiplication is a bilinear operation. So if you multiply on the left by two, it multiply the result by two and same on the right and, and equivalent. And by, if we impose these two things, uh, we, we can get exactly uh, those. This is like maybe the building blocks uh, of what is a uh, equivariant and bilinear, but you can then make more uh, weird operation by just taking either a subset. You can just um, output just the L equal to, and it's still bilinear and equivariant. And then you can, if you have a, if you have a, a more inputs here and here, you might have two different L equal to. Uh, as output, and you can then uh, linear, li linearly combine them, like add them together. And this operation as, as a whole is still bilinear and equivalent. So I still call it a tensor product. Well, wait, so what did you just say there? I can um, multiply, I can multiply these two here together and then uh, first to first generate this one, and also generate this one with like two different sets of weights. Is that what you meant? Uh, I'm. I mean, if uh, uh, if let's say in the input here you have this is an L equal two. The, it's dimension five, and let's say here we have a instead of just one vector, we have two vector. We have another one. Uh -huh. uh, then there is you can as output you can get uh, one, two, three, but 
two times okay. because see. yes once you multiply this by this and once this by this and now you end up with um these two l equals two vectors mm -hmm. only and then how do you combine them again with a tensor product or just by summing no but just by summing if you do an again a tensor product then it would be it would not be bilinear okay so i would not call that a tensor product it's yeah. still equivalent but it's not tensor product. but if you add these uh, two together uh the 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 end result yeah. is still bilinear and equivalent so uh, i call that a tensor product and that's what my the class in EQNN does. It can it uh, make this tensor product and uh, yeah. linearly combine them. Oh, okay, but now and that's what this this image is supposed yeah, to let's represent. Let's get into these images. <laughs> here we have a three. Uh, we have a vector here and a vector here, right? Because we have l equals one here and l equals one here. And here we have l equals zero, so we have just a number. And here we have a vector again. Mm -hmm. And we basically want to multiply the left uh, hand side with the right hand side. Okay, so what we do is we um, we take the tensor product. Let's first say how we do we get this thing, right? So how do we get the scalar out? What we do is we multiply this vector with this vector um oops which we do right here and yeah then we end up with a number because we do the dot product between the two vectors mm -hmm. and we also take this vector together with this vector and then uh to get together with this vector here and then we again end up with a number so here we have a number, here we have a number. We sum them together, and that's how we end up with this. Exactly. Okay, And but now why didn't we bring this into the play? Uh, because uh, there's vector no times way. scalar, there's no way to make a scalar. Okay. That's again the rule uh, L minus L2, this, this rule. There's no way to make a scalar in, in a... In a bilinear way. Bilinear and equivalent way. Exactly, exactly. So we don't include that here. Mm -hmm. Nice. But then we also have some other output, which is this. And this we get by, well, we can just multiply our number. Uh, oops, oops, oops. We can just multiply our number with a vector, which is what we do here, and put it in there. And we can also multiply the number with the other vector which is what we do here mm -hmm. and then put it in there and sum the, those two together yes right. okay but now um, here you can wonder why vector by vector does not make a, a vector uh this this link is missing this is because here we we on, not only consider representation of of a rotation but also parity uh, and uh, this is why we have these O's and E. Uh, it's the how the, the, the data transform and the parity inversion of space. O is for odd and E is for even. So the odd uh, representation, they change their sign if you apply um, an inversion of space. And uh, if you have uh, two uh, odd vectors, which are, which are called vector and the even vector are actually called pseudo vectors, if you multiply two uh, odd vectors together, you get a pseudo vector. So it's not a vector, and that's why you don't have this link in this example. Okay. And why don't I get a two out of here? You could. It's a, you have the choice. So we could get a two out of here. Exactly. But we yeah. just chose that we throw this away. And so our tensor product would actually kind of produce this. But now we say, yeah, we just keep these two exactly right and then we put uh, and now in our intensive field network what we would do is that we actually always like have a race where we have our first vector on the on the on the left side this we have in our array and on the right side we have our and this array 
which is made up of a vector down here and of a scalar up here. Mm -hmm. And then we do the weird tensor product. And what we get out is um, what we get out is basically two numbers that we sum together and two vectors that we sum together. And well, this is just a number and a vector. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to say that in this example, when we sum them together, we multiply by some weights. Mm -hmm. And this will be the long parameter of the neural network. OK, so now we get to the um, to the parameters of the neural network already. Perfect. Um, because here, what we do, uh, let me erase some stuff. This is getting pretty messy. Uh, what we do, if we um, combine this one here with this one here, for example, we we take the we just multiply the the number with the vector, right? And then we end up with this vector, but we actually additionally multiply it with some weight. Mm -hmm. And then we do the same here and the same here and the same here. Exactly. And these weights can actually be arbitrary numbers and the whole thing still is uh, the, the the whole output that we're getting is still equivariant yeah and bilinear yeah nice cool that's that sounds like it might be useful um let's see how it I actually there's many questions I mean, a few questions also a lot of answer to the question so can you draw a picture expressing spherical harmonics on a sphere and how you get equation six uh actually equation six is the the definition of spherical harmonics. So, uh, so there's no, I mean, it's no way to get it. But I think what might be useful is mm -hmm. um, I now have this vector right here, one, three, two, which is a point in space. Mm -hmm. How do I go? How do I throw that vector into um, my spherical harmonics? Yeah, I throw it in there. What, what do I get out? Um, um, How do I compute that? So the, the, the thing is, uh, there's, there's actually you can generalize a bit what spherical harmonics are. You don't need to have them on the unit okay, sphere. I, I, and uh, they can be a function of uh, any uh, three vectors, any three numbers that are not on the unit sphere. And, uh, and then uh, they actually boils down just to tensor products. And you have this uh, uh, drawing here that shows you that uh, spherical harmonics uh, one, of x is just uh, x, just the identity. And you can see it here. So uh, it's L equal one, and it's, you can see it as a, a polynomial of, uh, um, of degree of degree one, that gives you an L equal one. And then uh, when you do tensor product of x by itself, uh, we, we saw that we can get uh, one, two, and three as L as output. Uh, uh, no, zero, one, and two, sorry, because it's one times one. Uh, and you see these three here, and you can see them as uh, three different polynomials. And if you keep uh, only the higher L, it's actually the spherical harmonic L equal to. Okay. So what we're doing is we're when computing our spherical harmonics, we just do some tensor products. Yes. And we can like basically ignore that these even are spherical harmonics, right? We yeah. could say that Yeah, you can we say just, just polynomials. Yeah. Tensor products. We, we just do tensor products. Mm -hmm. Why do you call it polynomials? I mean, do you call it polynomials because we do a tensor product 
with ourselves again and again and just then yeah so uh I, polynomial is just uh 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 it's just a bunch of multiplication and additions okay yeah i mean i still find the word polynomial here confusing i mean okay so we have that the spherical harmonics can be written as just tensor products of the original vector with itself mm -hmm. in various different ways. Yes. Okay, nice. I did not know that. So, and this is also, yeah, cool. That then we we actually we have the actual computation that we're doing there as well. If we if we're using our point in three D space and then transforming it into um, some into some five element um, thing, which I don't want to call vector right now. Okay, then I suppose we can get into the final thing. I just want to write down a convolution. Oh, okay. Um... So let's write down a, a convolution, write what I do in my... Um, E3 and N is that I always that I, that is that I always let's say have this point here and it has a bunch it has three neighbors and now this point has some features f i mm -hmm. and these have some features f j f yeah let me not draw it like this um, but now I want to update f i the features of fi let's say if i is a vector like this right it has one scalar and a vector and then how do i uh, update the features of fi um, based on the coordinates here uh -huh. and the coordinates here and yeah, let's so maybe want to do a convolution. Yes. Right. I have my um, F or I have my FI plus F no, plus the, if I do some sum like this, where I then have um, my J, which are the neighbors. Mm -hmm. The neighbors of my i node, and then I have x i minus x j. Um, yes, and then I do the tensor product with f i, f j. Uh, ah, yeah. You can also put f i. Why can yeah. I also put f i? It's equivalent, <laughs> so it's also a. It's also uh, it's not it's less expressive. Uh, yeah, okay. no, uh, one, this but... would be like a weaker. Yes. Object. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but now I'm I don't understand this formula here that I wrote down here, right? Because I still need some else here and some yeah. Yes. What, what is the right? So right thing here? now that we have this uh, uh, very flexible tensor product operation that can basically eat any uh, direct sum of uh, uh, e-reps. Uh, you can, for the spherical harmonics, you can just put many spherical harmonics on top of each other, like the L equal zero, the L equal one, the L equal two. So you have a zero, one, two, it's a direct sum of those. And here in, in this, you said in your example, you have a scalar, and a vector. And so uh, these two representation, uh, when you do a tensor product of them, you can you can see it uh, as in uh, this uh, picture that is in the one. Uh, do you it's want one. your diagram? Yeah. This? Oh, it's just here. Yeah. yeah I just yeah. want too much stuff around it. Yeah. <laughs> we raise so, some. yeah, we can raise it. 
So uh, on the on the right, you can have your spherical harmonics. Uh, maybe here you will have the the two e and in extra, and on the left you will have your f j. So here you have zero e in, except instead of um, one o. You will have different connection patterns that are equivalent. You will have different weights uh, in there. Maybe you have uh, no. Let's continue like that, and then. Uh, you can choose to 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 map back again to one scalar and one vector, and and so this yeah this operation will do the job for you. Okay, and I guess then our fi will not. Uh, we can't do the sum here, right? We can. Yes. It's not. I mean, as you wish. Mm, but my fi is this, mm -hmm. and what we get out here. Let's say we use l equal um, oh, zero, you, one, you two, have, three, you four, five, choose, six. Yeah, but you can choose what's the output you want. So in this diagram, you have the the freedom to choose the output. You can choose it yeah. to be the same representation as the input or something else. Yeah, but if I want it to be, um. If I want it to be zero, one, and two, okay, yeah. then then you cannot ex exactly. Okay, but would it work if I then sum the zero and one together with these zero yes. and one? Yes, and leave the two as it is. Oh yes, you can. Is this actually what you do in E3? Exactly what we do. We we have what we call the a linear layer that multiply this f. That uh -huh. That will just you can a linear layer you can see it as just input output connected basically like that so if you have the zero e and one o and in the output you have zero e one o and uh, two e you will just get no pass that goes to the two e so it will be put zero all the time okay and we have uh, weight one here and weight two. exactly yeah okay um so in all of this i pretty much understood this convolution or did i miss something so or why do we now need these klebsch gordon coefficients oh you don't need to to care about them they are they are in the implementation of the tensor product and why because when you multiply like a vector by uh, another vector to 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 get a, a vector or l equal to two, you need to, to pick the right terms and multiply them by the right coefficients. And these coefficients are called the the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Uh, okay, so if I multiply a vector with a vector to get something of l equals two, right? Which are five. So I basically take the, an outer product. I end up with a three by three matrix. Mm -hmm. And now I need to pick five, um, yes, five numbers of this. Um, it's, it can be even more complicated. You maybe have to pick more than five and, and sum them sum together them with the right coefficients. Okay, yes. in such a way that the result is equivalent, and that's the that's the sorry the klebsch gordon coefficients. Okay, and if I write that's how I get something of L equals but if I have something of L equals, uh, let's say, five, then I have 11. I, I would need 11 numbers. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And how do I get them? Do I also just get them from this outer product? Uh, so you cannot get L equal five out of vector times vector, but if you do... Uh, vector times vector times vector? Yes, or if you do a L equal two, times l equal one uh, but we will do both right in our network won't we right we we will look at all uh, we will look at what we get from this mm -hmm. and we will get uh, look at what we get from the interaction between i uh, know from the interaction between one and one we just simply cannot uh, yes get. exactly i understand nice thank you um and yeah, if I now have this, this right here. If you have this um, right here, you have a, if you, if you 
do the outer product, you have a five by three uh, matrix. And here you have to, 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 to find a lot of uh, coefficients and numbers to get nice an L equal to two. Okay, that's very, very helpful. So, and th these are like the only, or are there like multiple Klebsch Gordon possibilities that I use for, could use for these coefficients to end up with something that's equivalent? Uh, in, in uh, for the group of uh, rotation, there's only one uh, for each uh, triplet, L equal one, L equal two, and L equal three. Uh, if the, the triplet satisfies this, then there is only one solution of clef and coefficient. And if it does not satisfy this, there is zero solution. Yeah, okay. But in other group like SUN, you can have multiple solutions. Yes. Nice. That's okay. Nice. Then I already also know a little bit about what these clef gordon coefficients are for. And with that, I could build my E3 and N. Mm -hmm. right? And you also have a very nice language to put this into code. Cool. Um, do you think we should mention anything else? Mm, so uh, I can show quickly, maybe. Uh, oh, I can show so the screen. Why, yeah, why not? A, we, can, we can show on your own. Mm -hmm. The, what do you want to show? The 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 ah, documentation. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I I would say that you show it, and okay. I simply find out how I stop my screen share. That's it. Okay. So to to finish, I just want to say that. Uh, so Etrian is a is a Python library in that is built on top of PyTorch. I have also a, now I have also a version of Jax that I really love. <laughs> they will not talk about it. Uh, and uh, so here you have the, the 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 documentation. It's also on GitHub. Um, you can install it with just a pip install. And uh, uh, quickly, the main operation of E3NN are covered in the documentation. And uh, there, are, there are classes called uh, something tensor product, which are these uh, tensor products that we recovered quickly. And they are all uh, in, uh, in this uh, here. O3 tensor products. And you have uh, the, like the, the full tensor product without uh, weights and the fully connected tensor product with the weights, the one we covered, and uh, how to use them. Yeah, and I can um, I can testify that this is pretty nice to use. Good. <laughs> cool. so, I think that was a very fantastic discussion. I enjoyed it a lot, but I also learned a lot and I hope you did as well. So yeah, maybe next time ask your own questions instead of watching only the video and join us in the, with the links in the description. All right.